Hi, I'm Chantelle Rohr, and today I want to first start by describing two classrooms to you, and I want to see if you can figure out what the difference is between these two classrooms. The first classroom, you walk in and there's busy bodies moving around the room, there's noise of laughter and play. You look over at the teacher, and you see the teacher is busy cutting out some activities. When it's time for the activity to start, the teacher raises their voice above the noise to try to get the kids' attention. So the kids slowly but surely, they get into their, their role and they clean up and they start to go to the carpet. And the teacher notices a little girl in the corner. And this little girl starts to cry. I don't want to stop playing with the dolls. And the teacher's frantically like, okay, we have to put it away. All the kids are waiting at the carpet. Let's head to the carpet. And after a couple minutes, they finally get this little girl to come to the carpet. And the kids are all wiggling and moving around, but the teacher just says, we're gonna go for it, we're gonna push through this project. Then you have a second classroom. You walk in again, the busybodies are moving around, there's noise filling the room. And, but you notice that the teacher is walking from student to student, connecting with the different kids in the class. When it's time to do the activity, the teacher plays an instrument and the kids stop. They put their hands on their head and they freeze and they listen for their teacher's instructions. Once the teacher dismisses them, they start to clean up the toys and they are getting ready to go to the carpet. And the teacher realizes as they're cleaning the toys that there's a little boy who just doesn't want to put the trains away and he's starting to fuss. So the teacher gets down at his level and communicates with him while at the same time giving praise to those kids that are doing well and reminding those kids who are off focus. So then the teacher starts a 10 second countdown. And by the time the 10 second countdown is over, the boy that want, didn't want to put the trains away has already cleaned up and is sitting with his class quietly on their carpet. She notices that they're still kind of wiggly, so she has them stand up and she has them do a song to get those wiggles out. And then they sit down and all engage in the activity. Two rooms, same age of kids, but two different ways to do it. What were some of the changes and the differences that you noticed? You may mention there, the one teacher was more organized. She had more control over her classroom. Um, she was prepared, she wasn't cutting things out, and the kids responded really well to her. If I were to sum all that up into a phrase, I would say classroom management. And today, we're gonna to be talking about different techniques to use in classroom management for early childhood, which is your nursery to your kindergartners. So you may ask, what is classroom management? I would say that classroom management is a proactive planning which equals effective learning environments. What I mean by that is you're preparing ahead of time. Before you even enter the classroom, you're being proactive and you're making changes and taking action before the things happen. So you're being proactive rather than reactive. It's having a plan in place. It's having routines and structures in place and being well prepared in your lesson and knowing exactly what needs to happen. It's knowing how to transition from point A to point B without losing control of your classroom. So what is your game plan? When thinking about your game plan, you need to remember five factors. The first being this, learning styles. There are three main learning styles that you'll face. There's visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. Your visual learner learns by seeing pictures. If they cannot imagine it or see it, they do not understand it. Your auditory learner is someone who learns through hearing or speaking. They need to be able to hear it and they need to be able to talk. Whether it's a question or an answer, they need to be able to talk to understand it. Your kinesthetic learner is your hands-on learner. They want to do with their hands. And if they stop moving, they stop learning. So one of our biggest mistakes is to make preschoolers sit still. That is the opposite of what we need to do. We need to let their little bodies wiggle so that they can continue to learn. The second is age or developmental stages. You need to be aware of what your kids are able to do socially, emotionally, what they're able to do with their language and communication that will impact the kind of questions you ask and the responses you'll receive, what they're able to do physically, whether they can hop on one foot for a game or whether they're still crawling around on the floor whether um, what they can do cognitively, how they think and how they process and how they problem solve. You need to be aware of what your kids are capable of understanding as well as that impacts the length of how you teach them as well. The younger they are, the shorter it has to be so they cognitively understand it. 
The third is kids with disabilities. This can range from kids with ADHD to autism. It can be a kid with a broken arm. It could be a kid with glasses or hearing aids. You have to be aware of what's in your classroom and how you're going to engage those kids differently. For instance, if you're going to play a very active game and it involves a lot of running, and a kid comes in with a broken leg, what are you going to have them do? A great example to have them do would be take score so that they're still engaged in the activity because we know when kids are not engaged, they get bored. And when they get bored, they act out. Or if they're not engaged, they feel discouraged and left out. And we don't want that for our kids. The fourth is the atmosphere and, and the environment you want in your classroom. How do you want the kids to feel when they walk in the room? Do they feel safe? What kind of energy do you want in the classroom? Is it going to be hyped up like kids' church, or is it going to be quiet like Sunday school? Are you going to have different learning styles that are quiet activities that the kids can do? These are things you have to think through. The fifth is classroom setup. Do you have enough space for the kids to roam? Remember, we talked about early childhood kids, they need to be able to move. Is there enough space for them to roam? But also, you don't want it to be just a dumping ground. So how are you breaking up your room but still providing the space that the kids need? Is it overstimulating or understimulating? Do you have too much on the walls that it distracts the kids? Or is it so plain that the kids are losing interest quickly? When you're doing your story, are you in a spot that is less distractive so the kids can focus? And do you have a quiet space for kids to go when they need to calm down? Those are things you want to think about when you're preparing for your class. Now, these five factors definitely need to be taken into consideration, but there are also techniques that help with transitions and grabbing kids' attention. So we're going to focus on those. In your packet that you have, you're going to have a lot of different options, but we're just going to go over a few of them. And I've broken them into three different categories. There are call-outs, there are music, and the third one is actions. So call-outs are when a teacher says something and the children respond. Now this will depend on the age. This is more, call-outs are more for your three, four, five, six-year-olds. But it would be something like the teacher would say, class, class, and the class would respond, yes, yes, but it's grabbing the kid's attention. Or you can do silly ones like macaroni and cheese, and the kids say, everybody freeze, and they freeze to listen to instructions. Those are different examples of call-outs you can use for those older ages. Another way is through music. And there are different songs that you can use to inspire the kids to do the best behavior they can have. An example would be I Spy, and it goes like this. It goes, I spy with my little eye, oh, I spy with my little eye, Joey and Susie and John. I spy with my little eye, oh, I spy with my little eye, the front row and the back row and the middle row. Good job, everyone sitting so quietly. And that helps the kids know what you're looking for, and they will copy their friends that are doing the same behaviors. Another one is called If You Are Listening. So this is another one for those of you that love to sing. It goes, if you are listening, if you are listening, touch your nose, touch your nose, fold your hands, fold your hands, close your mouth, close your mouth. And you can sing this, and the kids do the actions with you. So it gets those kinesthetic learners, the auditory learners, and the visual learners. And they know what to expect. And you just sing that until you have everybody's attention. And there's no hollering, but the kids just join in because they love song. Another way to use music is through instruments or bells and chimes. When they hear that bell and chime, they know to stop and freeze and pay attention to the teacher. But these are things that you will have to teach your kids and re continually remind them of how to do these things. The third one is actions. And a dismissal and transition example would, would be one that you could use. And this would be, okay, you get your voice down quiet and you whisper to the kids, you say, okay, this is what we're going to do when I snap my fingers two times. Make sure you're listening. We're gonna stand up. We're gonna walk with walking feet and we're gonna go sit at the table with our voices off. Do you think you can do that? And then they can give you a thumbs up, and you say, okay, let's see who can do it, and you snap your fingers, and the kids stand up, and they walk through, and as they're doing that, you're saying, oh, 
look at Joey with his quiet walking feet. Oh, Sam is doing such a great job keeping his voice off. Again, positive reinforcement is a key because you want to reward the behaviors that you want. But it's a simple instructions that you would give to the kids. Another one would be listening ears. This is another one that kinesthetic learners can do too because it makes them move. So you say, oh, everybody show me your listening ears. And the kids put their hands around their ears like this and they listen and you talk quietly. A lot of times we want to raise our voice to get the kids' attention, but what happens is the kids' volume continues to raise. But if you quiet your voice, the kids have to listen. They're forced to listen and you get quieter and you give your instructions. Another one would be attention soldiers. They love to do anything with soldiers, especially boys. And if you're in a military town, this works really well because a lot of those kids have fathers or mothers that are soldiers. So you have them stand like a soldier and you say, attention soldiers, and then you give them a task. Touch your nose. Soldiers freeze. Soldiers touch your knees. Kind of like Simon says, you can do that in that way. Another way to do this is modeling, and modeling is fantastic for twos and up, and it looks different depending on the age. So if a two-year-old, you can model almost like a follow the leader and model what it looks like to sit on the ground or to use walking feet. With older kids, I like to do it a little differently, and I will say, I need someone to model how to stand up quietly and walk to the table and sit down quietly for activity. Who thinks they can do that? And all the kids will jump up and they'll raise their hand, especially those four, five, six-year-olds. And you have someone show the right way. Oh, and as they're doing it, you say, oh, good job walking with your walking feet. Look how quietly they sat at the table. And you have the class give them a thumbs up. Then the second time you say, oh, I need someone who can show me how to do it the wrong way. And then the kids really go crazy. And I usually pick a kid that has a harder time listening for two reasons. It shows them that they can do it and also shows the class that they can do it so the class can hold them accountable. So you have that kid, you say, okay, when I say freeze, you need to stop, but can you show me how to do it the wrong way? And you let them run and you let them squeal and scream and then you say freeze. And then you have them come back to the carpet or wherever you're at and then you say, now I need you to model it the right way. So they've done it the wrong way, now they have to model it the right way. And you clap your hands and give them thumbs up as they do it. And then you say, okay class, now, if you think you can do it, stand up and you let the class go. So those are some other ways you can do that. Some other things for babies and toddlers that is different is the way you use your language especially. So if you have toddlers, they love to climb on everything, they love to get up on tables and chairs or whatever they can do. Instead of using a do not language, you need to use a positive language because if you use do not, all they hear is the last thing you say. So if you say do not run, all they're going to hear is run. So instead of saying do not run, you say use walking feet. Or if it's climbing, feet on the floor please, using language like that. And in your toddler's class, you also have to do a lot more hurting. So you're gonna go, everybody's gonna come this way and you kind of hurt them this way. And everybody's gonna come this way and you hurt them that way. Or you make it fun with marching or whatever it is to transition from one spot to the next. And just know, they have a very short attention span so don't try to, if you have a lesson, cut it in half. And if it's not working, move on to something else. Don't feel like you're a bad teacher because it's not working. They just have a very short attention span. So what do you do when you lose control? A lot of times we lose that control in that transition time. So making sure you have those clear instructions is important. But if you are completely out of control of your classroom, there are a couple things you can do. One of them is lights. You can flicker the lights. That lets kids know when the lights get turned off, I need to stop what I'm doing, I need to freeze. And also helps bring the volume down a little bit. Another one, if they're completely out of control, is having everyone put their head down. And I mean everyone, heads down, voices off. You say heads down, voices off, and you let them sit in silence for a couple minutes. They don't like to sit in silence. But when they're completely quiet, this is when you give instructions. When I say to put your head up, I need you to quietly sit at the table, voices off, eyes on me. It actually works really well. So a heads down is another way. For If you feel like you've completely lost your kids, you can have a squirt bottle and call it the, the mystery mist, uh, sorry, the magical mist, and you spray it. And the kids feel 
that. And when they feel that, they know it's time to quiet down. I do not recommend doing this all the time. This is like when you have lost control. Most kids don't want to be sprayed, okay? So but if you've lost control, it's a way to get the kids to feel. If they are not hearing you, it's a way they can feel it and know that, oh, we've gone too far and we need to calm down. With your babies, your toddlers, and even your preschoolers, balloons are your best friend too. Again, don't give balloons out to kids without instructions because what you're going to end up having is kids hitting each other with them. But it's a good way to distract from the chaos and bring their focus in. So you show them a balloon and of course they're going to want one. And then you quiet them down and you give them clear instructions. These balloons are for playing with, not hitting with. Keep them to yourself. Keep them on your own body, but you can toss them up. Okay? Give them instructions first and then give balloons. Bubbles, again, are a lifesaver, especially in the nursery. If you have bubbles going, those kids will come and they'll run again. You have to still give instructions. Watch out for friends around you. Don't push. Use walking feet, right? Again, give the instruction first. That's being proactive so that you're going to get rid of some of those behaviors. Sensory play is another way to get kids' attention in the younger ages, too. If you feel like everything is going crazy, if you pull out a water sensory table or some kind of sensory activity like those water beads or something like that, it's going to get kids' attention and help cause them to calm down because they want to play with it, but they need to hear the instructions first. One of the biggest things you need to do when you've lost control is halt. And I learned this from Jeffrey Portman. I don't remember who he learned it from, but there's, it has a meaning. The H is hungry, the A is angry, the L is lonely, and the T is tired. Now we can still function if we're one of those, but if we're both, if we're two or more, we need to take a moment and halt and step back and refocus. So if you're hungry and angry, I know for me, if I'm hungry and angry, I have a hard time focusing. So I have to step back, refocus. If I need a snack on a couple kids' crackers, do that. I'm sure your pastor won't mind. But halt and take a break and refocus. And take time to pray and say, God, give me wisdom and help me to see these kids the way you see them. So as we're closing out today, and you're remembering to do all this, these children's ministry things, as you're creating this plan, don't forget to think about those five factors. Don't forget to use those techniques for transitions from A to B to resolve some of the issues that you're going to have with behavioral problems. And remember, when you feel overwhelmed, take a moment to halt, to step back, to pray, to refocus, so that you can come into this in a calm way to calm your kids down. Thank you for your time.